conversation. Uh, the reason why I want to sort of have, and so it is in this context of what is a structural change and what is that nature of that structural change, I think it's important to have this conversation. So this conversation is not easy and I, I acknowledge its contextual uh, challenge as well. The second part of this is that I think, is that I think when you place this in the wider epoch of, of, of transformation, I think we are facing a kind of a systemic crisis of worldviews, where you would argue that over a 400 year theory of, uh, over the 400 year theory of enlightenment, which actually looked at how we separate things out and looked at the world through separation, classification, subject object object thinking that classification uh, that separation allowed us to ignore our entanglements and that that willingness to ignore our entanglements has been has created i would argue the symptoms of the crisis that we face today climate change inequality many of these other, other structural issues at the same time that separation also also created a permission of violence we know that in terms of um, racialization, race as a theory was constructed as a theory of separation to permit violence. And that tool has been used over and over again in different formats. And we also know that actually, whether it's in other forms of violence, whether, whether it's our planet and other forms, I think it's worth us considering that, that as we move from an age of objects to entanglements, where our entanglements become more visible and real, there's a real fundamental question of how we organize. The division of public and private no longer seems real, neither from the private side nor from the public side. Actually, the entanglements are massive and, and continuous. Uh, I think there's a really good pieces of research all the way through uh, people like, even people like McKinsey who've been talking about 40% of the balance sheet of a company is generated by public goods and public infrastructures and public value. So. In an age of entanglement, how do we operationalize ourselves? And I think the next part is, in an age where control, centralized control becomes very ineffective because actually in a complex emergent world, control doesn't, the centralization of control doesn't have the information. We know CEOs have less than 7% of the information to draw, to understand what the real problems are or the challenges the organization faces on the ground. How do we move from control to learning? And increasingly in a complex system, learning orientated, leadership becomes more and more critical, but innovation and agency needs to be at the front end of, of the system. And finally, and perhaps more, more critically, I think there's a bigger question which sits at the, at the thesis of how we think about the world from a um, increasingly what is a planetary singularity. It, it, you know, whether you look at the food systems crisis or the gas crisis or financial systems, actually what we're starting to see is a planetary level uh, sort of interdependence. At the same time, what we're seeing is um, not only just planetary interdependence, a kind of, whether we dealt with ozone layer or whether we're dealing with climate change, these global commons are restructuring or requiring us to restructure how we see our relationship, not only within ourselves, but actually interdependently at a, more, at a larger level. So is a state a boundary or is a state a metabolic flow of relationships? And how do we perceive that? How do we organize that? Now, I know this is a bit high level, but I just want to situate it in what I think is a larger theory of change. Now, I'm gonna very quickly, oh, so could someone just give me host rights? So I can just share. Yeah, one second. Yeah. So it's in this context that I think we wanna talk about radical civics, and I'm gonna to try to be relatively brief uh, probably about seven minutes and then uh, open up this conversation. So I, I think one of the first questions is building a movement for civil society or civic society-led civilization. Is there an alternative path which isn't structurally as David Graeber rooted in kind of the violence of state as a kind of uh, fundamental movement. And increasingly history tells us there is. What are the deep structures required for the transformation to a radical civic future? And more and more, we would argue that looking at the transformation of our capacity in our bureaucratic systems, 
it's I think the bureaucratic transformation that we're witnessing is opening up really interesting radical civic pathways. And then how do we actually experiment into this future and really challenge some of this stuff and build on what is already growing around the world in many formats? I think this for me is a framing piece which I've kind of slightly discussed, but we are living in an age of war. And the war I mean is an everyday war, a war against each other in terms of actual inequality and the violence that we generate, or war against our planet, and a war certainly against future generations. And those and these war instruments of war are embedded into our everyday reality, where our contract theory is based on actually predatory optimization, not actually contracts of care. Our monetary theory massively drives a centralization of monetary production, which draws and extractive models into our, into our economy. Um, and I think these everyday instruments are actually very problematic. And I think it, there's a really interesting question to be had about them. And simultaneously, we are locked into these old pathways in multiple formats. And the kind of social history of our lock-ins are really is, I think we've forgotten our capacity to deal with deep lock-ins, whether it, and it wasn't a complete address at all, but 1833, when the UK spent 25% of GDP abolishing slavery, we have done extraordinary things to make extraordinary moves. Definitely not sufficient, certainly in 1833, but these were extraordinary transformations to unlock ourselves from path dependencies. And in a way, this also opens up a real question about relationships, civics, and civil society in really fundamental formats. A lot of the work that we're, we've been doing and is really built on work that we've been doing for over 12, 13 years now, whether it's actually writing the compendium for the civic economy or building the wiki house or open desk, or actually talking, talking about new civic, civic uh, capital structures and looking at how the fire line in New York could be financed in different ways. But I think at the root of it is actually a need to look at much more of the structural issues our theories of ownership, our theories of relationship with land, our theories of relationship with the future and our practices of them, which are material. The trees you see probably next to you uh, outside your window are currently a liability for most local authorities. They are not perceived, their environmental and social goods are not perceived in our accounts, accountancy frameworks and our public accounting frameworks. So actually these structural issues are causing local authorities to chop down trees after 10 years because the uh, insurance costs and uh, maintenance costs become too excessive. So we think it's really critical to start to look in a way when we talk about the civic economy as almost this uh, initial birth was very much about looking at the brilliant examples that were happening around the world. We're increasingly seeing that there are some structural deep code issues that need to be dealt with. And no longer can the civic economy be a crack, filling, papering the crack, a crack between the capacity of the centralized capacity of the, and the relatively centralized capacity of the state and the, and the capacity of the private sector, but actually much more structural transition. Looking very, very deeply into new possibilities. So one of the things that we often talk about is that a shift in our, in our capacity for agreements going from one to one agreements and one to one contract law to many to many fundamentally transforms what is a, the, the idea of the private economy as a means of value creation to a civic economy, because the many-to-many -many agreements uh, actually create a new type of obligation to collective and shared goods. So we're seeing the bureaucratic transformations open up new pathways of being able to look at the future. And the same is true whether we're not, you know, just to be clear, we're not big fans of Bitcoin. We think it's socially regressive, but actually currency and the democratization of currency production and the capacity to do that, I think, open up new pathways for deeper democracies in terms of agency. And how do we look at that all the way through identity systems? Uh, how do we really build relational identity systems, which are fundamental? We also know, actually, our legal systems no longer are able to provide genuine pathways for justice to many peoples. So how do we start to rebuild some of the, uh, some of the kind of uh, legal infrastructure and the kind of accommodating infrastructure, which is genuinely powerful in new, uh, in new pathways? And this sits in a context of this stuff is happening. This is not make-believe. I mean, whether it's actually lakes or rivers, we are seeing a new type of civicness emerge where we see the world around us being, being uh, given legal personhood and recognized in a, in a way as a legal person to which we do not own, but we are in relationship to. 
and that fundamental transition we're starting to see in many nature-based environments around us, but in really structural ways. So how looking at whether it's sort of um, looking at value. So how do we go from understanding value from understanding the value of a forest from its value of a tree, uh, timber, but actually understanding it from an entangled co uh, value proposition of, of timber, ecosystem services, multiple entangled value systems. How do we go from this single point optimization of ownership to a deeper appreciation and relationship to the entanglement of value? How do we go from this, uh, this kind of human-centric model to a relationship treaty-centric model, which seems fundamental in terms of being able to, it's not a moral position, it's actually a position of how we understand, operate and care in a complex emergent world. And it opens up some really key pathways into that future. How do we actually reimagine our relationships with, uh, with our environment? I mean, it, so in the, so really brilliant work that's been done and, and actually historical work around actually reimagining our relationships with our non-human relatives, the nation of trees, the bird nations, looking at the world in new relationships, I think is fundamental to actually exploring some of these civic pathways. For me, for us, the civic is not just the idea of uh, human to human, but human to future and human to uh, non-human systems as well. How do we understand value in new ways? So whether it's the High Line in New York, which pains me hugely, an extraordinary investment in civic infrastructure, 173 million, it would have paid for itself if only 10% of the land value uplift it generated was shared back, it would have paid for itself in 10 months. So we know civic goods construct vast amounts of spillover value, yet they're undervalued and underpriced because they are extracted from as opposed to invested in. And how do we start to think of these the, the civic infrastructure in new ways? And dealing with not only the ins, uh, spillover effects, but the intangible effects, but also the import, embodied carbon. So how do we look at this world from an intang intangible perspective? How do we hold uncertainty, which I think is a really big issue at a societal level? It's increasingly clear that in, all, in order to hold uncertainty, we have to build the capacity and the capability of people not to be precarious. And everyone talks about universal basic income, but which I think is a really interesting option. But the really fundamental question is, what would happen if we were have, is a universal based basic income delivered by the state a good thing? Or would we need to construct a new theory of allocation of resources and new ways to build universal basic income in more in a different format, which doesn't create the centralization of power in theories of state, but actually complements the power of state with new civic large scale infrastructures. So what are these alternatives it becomes really important. Our theories of identity, I think singular identity versus relational evolutionary identities, how do we build that capacity of, of reimagining identity? There's some really great work that's been done all over the place around that. These are really deep fundamentals which need to be addressed in that format. And building what is, I mean, I, I think uh, some of the work that Cassie, you've been doing around, uh, Caroline, very, many, many of you actually, around building the commoning infrastructures. What are the commoning infrastructures that are critical to be able to build some of these civic futures becomes really critical. And fundamentally, this also means the new theory of democracy, where democracy is not relegated to the vote, where democracy is a theory of agency. And how do we build a distributed agency in many pathways? So I've talked, I wanted to talk a little bit through some of these prints, these emerging principles, but actually what these rely on is really some of the deep code issues that I mentioned earlier. And addressing those deep codes becomes very critical. Now, we've been looking at some experiments, but I, I think I think whilst we can talk about this big stuff, this also manifests in how do you build, imagine a new uh, forests which is self-owning how do you operationalize it how do you build trusts which are actually self-governing efficiently which can be replicated all around the world and all around the country how do we how do we manifest some of these things what if a forest takes self ownership how is public good identified how is public good evolved not even just fixated on how is stewardship uh, ownership replaced by stewardship what is the new relationship of care that it builds how do you construct contract contracts of care how do you build a care economy when we know vast amounts of our care economy is undervalued and completely undervalued and certainly underpriced, but we don't want to instrumentalize in theories of transaction because care cannot be transacted. It must be a gift, but it needs to be recognized socially. How do we construct a positive society for care without actually becoming instrumentalized and financialized and reduced to simple transactions when it's never as effective as when its care is actually something far greater? 
and how do we, how, how, what are the models of driving some of these things? What is a combination of gift economies, market economies, and welfare, welfare systems? How do they work together in new, new formats? And how do we genuinely create those spaces in equitable formats rather than extractive formats? And these things manifest for us in everyday realities of, you know, all the way from a house um, and how do you finance a house in a way that it doesn't become a new value extracting mechanism, doesn't become a rent seeking mechanism in process and drive it in affordability into the future. How do you care for it? How do you structure it all the way through? And I suppose I want to end here uh, in, in this conversation because I think whilst we can have these big conversations, I think what's really critical is that we create some of these experiments as real experiences, which is what we are starting to do. Physical experiences, which actually allow people to uh, experience these new alternative social realities, experience actually um, uh, public conversations around that, experience actually some of the system level innovations that are required and actually challenge underpinning for theories in terms of the white papers that are driving some of the story. So with that, I'm gonna stop um, and come back uh, to the group. So I wanted, firstly, I want uh, to uh, thank everyone for their patience in listening, um, uh, li listening to me. But I, I just wanted to set a bit of a scene of where we're going. And I recognize this isn't a straightforward conversation in a way, but I do think it's an important one in actually going beyond the kind of addressing of symptoms to some of the deep structural issues of how we organize it. So I, maybe I'm going to start by actually just um, bringing some reflections and some personal reflections in onto the conversation, and then hopefully we can end with a kind of more group uh, group, group collective uh, interrogation uh, in that format as well. Um, Audrey, can I come to you first and just to hear your thoughts and reflections about this, because you've been leading some extraordinary work in actually transformation of change using very civically driven processes. And I think you almost, you know, some of your practices are building what I would say is a radically civic democracy in itself and a state in a, in a new format. So maybe I'd love to come to you first to get your reflections. Thank you, yeah. Um, at the beginning of your sharing, you said, uh, and I quote, may I have the host rights, mm -hmm. end of quote. Uh, that and uh, unmute yourself were the kind of two utterances that we hear a lot during those online conversations. And, and I think unmuting ourselves and sharing the rights to host uh, are actually the, the, the core uh, that I got from, from your presentation. Um, because previously, um, it's easy to, to imagine an exit, right? The, the term metaverse in Snow Crash was invented by people in that novel, Snow Crash, uh, who want to wear something to escape from a dystopian reality. So exit is easy to imagine. Indeed, it's still uh, in many parts of the world uh, where people exit to cyberspace, independence, and things like that. Uh, on the other hand, voice, unmuting oneself, sharing of the host's rights. Uh, indeed, your example illustrates a, a house, a garden, a forest, and so on, sharing host rights to, to host us. I think that's much, much more powerful. And so uh, I think this is about a pattern uh, that take each and every overly individualistic imagination of the hype curve of technology and then systematically translate that into something that is civics oriented. Six years ago, when I became Taiwan's digital minister, uh, I wrote a prayer, a poem as my job description uh, to illustrate that you can't take any words of hype and turn it into a work, into action. And so I'll just, it's really short, recite my job description it goes like this. Um, when we see the internet of things, let's make it an internet of beings. When we see virtual reality, let's make it a shared reality. When we see machine learning, let's make it collaborative learning. When we see user experience, let's make it about human experience. And whenever we hear that a singularity is near, let's always remember the plurality is here. 
Now, th these individual ideas, plurality, shared reality, and so on, uh, are not as important as this almost knee-jerk reaction that whenever you hear something that uh, overly isolates uh, individuals or over concentrates hosts' rights um, to, to imagine states and so on, uh, there's an instinctive reaction that said, no, there's actually a, a, a better way uh, to do that. Uh, and that's indeed uh, what our um, call to fork the government in Taiwan or to imagine democracy as a form of social technology precisely have done. So much so that when people find there's anything wrong with our counter epidemic measures or counter infodemic measures and so on, the knee jerk reaction is now uh, not to demonstrate to protest, but demonstrate by building a proof of concept because people know quite reliably that there are better ideas of mass distribution, contact tracing, or anything really uh, will become nationwide uh, implementations if it's based on open standard within like 24 hours. It's as quickly as that. Just pick up your phone, call a toll-free number, and then your small scale 500 um, people experimentation become the national standard. Uh, but of course, with always the provision that somebody else may forget the next day and the next day. So it's about increasing the bandwidth of agency, it's about reducing the latency of making of the common sensing, uh, commoning uh, behavior. So that's what we have learned in the past uh, couple of years. And I, I don't want to go on. <laughs> the nature itself doesn't go on. As the Dao De Jing says, I would uh, really like to hear others speak. Thank you so much, Audrey. And I, I think your leadership in some of this stuff has been extraordinary. And, and the practical leadership is deeply appreciated in that way as well, because I think I think one of the first, you know, in a way you, you know, whilst I think it's easy to be critical of state, I think what you've started to do is actually transform the theory of state into being a civic state and its relationship to, to be able to enable that. And I think it opens up a really powerful conversation into that deeper collaboration in that pathway. So thank you first. Um, can I, um, maybe, I, could I come to you, Nick? Um, I'm going to come slightly in there, because in a way, you've been a really brilliant friend and a really good critical friend as well, which I think has made the work better, stronger in many formats. And in a way, you sit at the intersection of, of many of these conversations in, in a different way, in a different lens, in a different capacity. And it'd be great to hear your thoughts and reflections as to that part of that process. Uh, uh, thanks, Indy. Um, and thanks for this uh, chance to share some thoughts on this really fascinating kind of space you've opened up. Um, I, I guess... Um, what I find most interesting in this and, and relevant for the teams I've worked as part of is this idea of, of a massively undervalued civic space. Um, and when I say that, I think of really, you know, as simply as people acting for and on behalf of each other, I'm getting on with it, basically sorting out problems for and with each other, realizing shared ambitions for and with each other, working through pain and trauma together, finding workarounds together. Um, you know, the, the, as this work describes, kind of, you know, individuals, collectives, and communities work that work uh, uh, that are working within society, confronting many multi-layered challenges on a daily basis. And um, it, even though this clearly makes up so much of what is beautiful and important about our society, it is massively, relentlessly undervalued in its ways of working and relating. In it, in in comparison to the ways of working and relating of the state, and in comparison to the ways of working and relating of the market which I'm not diminishing or, uh, but, but, but just pointing to the, the like massive over-dominance of those ways of kind of thinking and working and relating. Bringing this into a little bit more practical day-to-day -day experience, and this might end up with me sounding a bit more prosaic than some others, but um, uh, of work within kind of communities um, and, and sharing a little reflection on some of that work and, and how this project has helped kind of provide a lens for that with, by the way, the, the very important subheading to that work of the last kind of 20, 25 years. Um, as, a, as a white middle-class man with a certain education, I have experienced, yes, of being very frustrated by the lack of potential to kind of operate within that civic space, but of also being massively overvalued in the role I can play and in my contribution, which I come back to, and which is important to what we're talking about here. Um, so, so I just a little example of that work. So we've been part of lots, lots of teams that have tried to help shift local food systems, again, as this conversation has highlighted, um, the importance of um, trying to drive them towards being more sustainable, more equitable, healthier, and this is obviously more important than ever for lots of reasons. And, you know, we're looking ahead to a year of massively increasing food prices, which will push many more 
households into poverty uh, on top of so many other squeezes on 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 on, on household finances we've also just seen a year or two years in which a lot of national and international infrastructure around food has broken down and we've relied on and needed our local food systems and they, they've sometimes been there um, and sometimes it's just been completely bled dry um so ultimately in all of that work wanting to inhabit this civic space um uh, but continually being pulled back into that kind of state or market-driven mindset or ways of working. So what does that feel like? What's the actual kind of experience of that? And again, as someone who's had an enormous amount of passes uh, and overvaluing within that, but still seeking to be collaborative and collective, but basically being pushed into being competitive and independent, you know, competing for providing services to government as a single actor or competing in a, in a, in a marketplace, um, wanting to pursue kind of long-term intentions, but forced into short-termism, nearly impossible to get support for longer term goals within like very narrow political cycles or beyond the kind of immediate expectations of commercial investment wanting to be working mutually and equitably towards shared goals but being pushed into more dissociated and equitable relationships service users service providers producers consumers commissioners providers wanting to just be in amongst the like mess and uncertainty but having to contrive neat deliverable outcomes and outputs um, despite imagining very different ways of for things to work and seeing and feeling them in the work that goes on in communities all over the place being compelled to come back to intentions that are really about optimizing you know data-driven feedback loops that are just about worshipping what is and and very small iterations of kind of how things work now um, and and also fairly obviously and again i'm on one side of these and i acknowledge that very strongly but these spheres also contain massive biases and prejudices you know the groups based on race gender geography sexuality muck cells uh, um that government clearly trusts and mistrusts for example invests in and and impoverishes represents and excludes that flows through all, all, all of this work and um and it flows through also every policy every procurement process every contract every investment relationship um and and we've seen it in food you know we we you know we, we we've 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 seen that very very strongly um particularly over the last year and the uh, uh, last couple of years and and the market you know even more clearly will always prioritize those with wealth and income over, over those with less um and unless you try to break those market forces which you know lots of tired social entrepreneurs are trying to do you know you're always going to reflect that and and then there is the final the final point i made that kind of systemic overvaluing and undervaluing as i said i'm someone who's overvalued and we've seen in, in in relationship with food you know the government trusted and valued profit maximizing companies to know what food should be provided to families on the verge of starvation and didn't trust families to do that you know, I'm going to trust parents to make those decisions. You know, it's got a, an extreme example of who is trusted and, and who is not by these by these very dominant models. So I guess the final thing, I guess the what I found so challenging, and inspiring about this, and I realize I've stayed quite broad. Or one of the kind of in one of the underlying questions is that it's opened up a much stronger ambition to find and spend more time in that. And I think that that is also partly for me personally. We, we, um you know about closing the kind of professional and personal space as well you know i've been part of an agency for a long time that has charges certain rates and has certain project size minimums all that kind of stuff that is, you've got to acknowledge that as a bit of part of the problem of this as well if we want to inhabit this space explore different horizons we have to get out of some of those constraints we've created for ourselves and again as a privileged person I, i've got some control over some of those constraints um so yeah i, I think um uh, yeah, it, it's pushed me hard and made me think about how and where I want to be spending more time as someone who calls themselves a designer or a social entrepreneur, whatever that means. Um, and um, yeah, I, I've, I've loved being challenged by that. Sorry, Andy, you're, you're muted. Um, it was a classic, uh, it was a classic moment. Um, uh, this, uh, thank you, Nick, for for that uh, for that reflection. Really appreciate it. I think there's a few things that you brought up that I think are you know there's many things actually, but a few that really I'd love to pick up on. One is in a way the kind of and this is where it becomes slightly difficult, but in a way we are constantly instrumentalized to address the symptoms, and actually because the symptoms are have everyday politics to them, and they have everyday utility. But actually, the underlying issues, the deeper code issues, are actually almost exempt from the space of operation. So it's very rare, and I, you know, it's very rare to get the time 
to even think about this stuff or to be able to orchestrate and map some of the stuff out and to build these sort of conversations because actually the instrumentalization to the action actually is i would say it's almost uh, self-perpetuating you've got a wounding system and you keep patching up the wounds but you don't go for the underlying issues which are actually driving some of these uh, things at a much more structural level and i think that does create this what i would say is the kind of the, the service orientation of the civic of civic society as opposed to almost a generative base for new civilizations which i think is one of the things that i think you know is open to question in a deep sense um thank you nick um, I'd love to, Dan, um, I'd love to come to you. Um, uh, I know this conversation is is outside your comfort space in a way when we discussed it, but I really wanted to have you here because I think you bring a really important perspective in this conversation. And it's really important that you're here in this in, in this dilemma that we I think we're, we're putting forth and would love to hear your thoughts in terms of how this relates to your world, world, world as it's materializing. No, thanks, Indy. I think, you know, you, you could see me as a skeptic, having been involved in politics and policy in sort of previous uh, lives too much and, uh, and struggling to do what, what one could. You know, I was working as, a, as an advisor for the, for the Labour government, uh, you know, trying to do what you can within the constraints of uh, electoral politics, uh, okay. world crises, <laughs> uh, financial constraints, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, but I think your, the basic point, Indy, that, that you're sort of making, in a sense, is we need very, very big system change. It's kind of what you're talking about. And I think doing that analysis, thinking about it, is really important. And I think what you just said, actually, Indy, as well, is that we don't think enough about that. Um, and that does constrain the sort of mindset that we have. I mean, it's, it's been interesting, you know, at, at MPC, you know, we, we in our sort of a lot of consultancy work, we've done a lot of think tank work, but system change has come much more to the fore, a lot of uh, funders, um, uh, philanthropists being in, interested in system change and charities and so forth, um, because partly because they realize otherwise they're just dealing with the symptoms and they want to move upstream and work out why these symptoms are uh, occurring. And some of them will be some of the things you mentioned, Indy. I mean, I do think though, I, I guess I, you know, when you do look at systems um, and what's going wrong um, and why it's producing those outcomes, I think there's, there's often a lot of blockages and there's a lot of places where things are not working. And some of those are caused by the state, but some of them are not. And some of them can be released by the state and some of them can't. So I guess my sort of take on all of this is, is I'm, I'm definitely a bit less hostile to the state than, than perhaps others are. I think it's important. I think if I look at, for instance, the uh, social sector, charities and community groups and all the rest of it, you know, I do share, you know, I'm a obviously fantastic fan of it it's it's brilliant and it's going to be absolutely necessary do it playing its role for us to um be a good society any society needs that kind of thing for the good work it does the social capital it creates the pluralist voice it creates but we're going to need it um firing on all cylinders if we're going to tackle things like inequality and climate change and so forth but you know it does have and i think some of the things others have talked about you know that worries me particularly given you know uh, i'm a sort of center left kind of person uh that it's um it, it's unequal um it kind of uh it, you know if you if you like to even where the sector organizes within the uk at least you know you get more charities in more prosperous places um by by definition it happens where it happens not necessarily where it's needed etc cetera, etc cetera. uh and so for me you do need the state and therefore what I get more interested in, in, in thinking about this whole agenda is in a way how can we make the state be that in the national state or the local state think very differently about civic society and how to embed it and I'm perhaps <laughs> too optimistic that there's a number of changes that one could make for instance the way in, in the UK that Whitehall and Westminster work um, which would put the whole of civic society far more on its agenda I mean some of them are slightly you might say they're kind of trivial, but I think if you did lots of them, you know, a cabinet minister that, that, that had this in their title, uh, whether they wrote a poem or not, is, a, is another matter. But I thought that was very interesting. I rather enjoyed that. Um, you know, requirements for them to uh, to think through whenever they've got a kind of policy objective, whether whether a sort of state engineered top down approach, which is what we usually get in the UK, is the right way or whether you couldn't uh, harness, embrace, talk to civic society and achieve the same thing in a much better and sort of inclusive uh, way, um, all sorts of things like that. There's a whole number I've written about this 
over the years. And, and I, I'm optimistic that you, you could get a, um, a change in the way that the state thought about civic society. Um, and then, and then it, would, it would behave in different ways. And I think that would be a very big system change. I think you're seeing a bit more of it in the UK, and I don't know if it happens, but I think it does happen in other countries in, in more sort of devolved areas. Within the UK, I've been quite, I've always been a fan of the directly elected mayors because I feel that they tend to feel that they are the representative of the whole community that elected them. Whereas the traditional way we have things uh, in Britain is that we have the leader of the council who tends to see themselves as the defender of the council services, uh, uh, whether they're provided directly or they're outsourced. Whereas when you're the elected mayor, they, they, they look at the whole area, let's say Greater Manchester, the mayor there, you know, what have we got? What are the assets? It's the private sector, it's the public sector, it's civic society. Um, you know, how do we work and get them all together? How do we all work together? Um, how do we get the relationships right? All that kind of thing. So, so I, th that's what I do at the moment. I mean, I think some of the other, you know, ideas we played about, I like the idea, Indy, that, that um, about how can we experiment with some of these things. And although, again, as a kind of, you know, long time policy person, the number of sort of, whatever you call them, experiments, pilots, trials, whatever, that sort of showed something or other, and then nobody ever managed to scale. And that's partly because the nature of these things often is about relationships, which are uh, place and time specific, and then it gets it very hard to, to broaden them and widen them. So in a sense, I think we have to be careful on our experiments. So what, what are we trying to do? We're not trying to find something that sort of we can then replicate, pick up and sort of get somebody to fund it, have it everywhere. But we're trying to get across to people there is a different way of thinking about the world, a different way about how we relate to each other. And those experiments are very valuable. How we then get them into the mainstream of thinking, I think, is, is difficult because, I mean, all of us, uh, we probably, you know, we might have different takes, but we probably kind of all agree broadly with this. Meanwhile, the rest of society is getting on with, with their lives, worrying about cost of living crisis and persuading them at the minute that the reason that's all happening is, is something uh, due to the nature of, of the way society works. Coming out of the financial crash, um, which I was working in Downing Street that time, afterwards, it was great hopes that the public in all countries would think we've got a rotten system. How could it produce something like this? Surely we've got to question the, the, the sort of version of capitalism we've got and a lot of things that went wrong. And it didn't really last, to be honest, and it didn't really last in a lot of countries. And in a sense, the, the reaction we got, rather than a kind of switch to that kind of thing, and maybe some of the agendas you've been talking about, Indy, we went to populism, uh, which is a kind of frightening thing. And then, and then from other countries, you know, we've, we've got sort of Russia on the warpath, China being pretty unpleasant. It didn't really change worldviews. So I think, it, I think it's difficult. But I do think there's things we can do. I'm optimistic, um, if, if a bit less utopian than perhaps some of the others uh, here. I appreciate that, Dan. And, and I think your point about that this isn't this is, doesn't need to be an anti-state agenda. I think, as Audrey has beautifully shown, I think there is a conversation about civic state in a really deep sense, which does shift power. I, d I do think devolution is a is a kind of 19th century response to the complexity problem. I don't think it really generates the it just devolves power to another set of people who then think it's their remit. Uh, so I think there's a really deeper question to be had about whether devolution is, is it feels so like a 20th, 20th century response or a 19th century response. To what is a, a inherent complex, deep, complex problem where there isn't a monolithic single act, but I think it's, it's a path in the better direction uh, in that format. So I really appreciate that. Um, Cassie, can I come to you next? Um, I suppose, You've been operating both as a funder and, an, and a, a kind of change maker in this space for a while, a long while, a significant while in driving this. And you've created some really powerful spaces for these sort of exploration through, through the roles that you've held. And maybe just a bit of reflection from, from a funder perspective or, and the politics of funding maybe even perspective of being able to actually support this deeper review that that's, I, you know, I would suggest is necessary. How do, you, how do you think about this? Thanks, Indy. My, well, my notes don't correspond with your question, so I might answer it a bit and also look at my few bullet points. Um, I mean, the first, as you were talking and presenting, I suppose the first thing that I just sort of wanted to say to whoever was listening out in the audience um, and might go on to watch this is to like 
not turn away. I think we can hear some of this language or see some of these beautiful diagrams but what do they really mean or you know find some of it you know pe people Indy we've talked about this people might sometimes find the work that Dark Matter Labs is doing as impenetrable and I suppose the first thing that I would ask people to do is is you know one of Donna Haraway's phrases of like stay with the trouble like don't turn away this isn't going away this is complex it is hard the scale of change, the depth of change, the shifts that we need to make are enormous. And if we don't stay in conversation like this or have these conversations, we are never going to be able to really affect the kind of change we need to. And so I suppose that would be one of my big reflections just in, in the funding world. Now, of course, not every funder, and uh, you know, I'm a huge fan of Esme, Fairbairn and Caroline, so there are funders that are asking big questions and doing deep work, but generally that wasn't a conversation it was easy to have. To be fair, I guess I started working in funding only a year before the pandemic, and I think in a pandemic it was really hard for anyone to have some of these kind of conversations, so I also want to acknowledge that. But I, I do feel like this kind of, yeah, this engagement with depth and complexity is not common and that's not just in funding I mean I think that's just in in the world um so I think that's a huge like like that's a huge need um I also think that yeah you, you know you talk about propositioning and Dan you've just touched on experimenting and I and I think we don't know how to fund well that kind of more experimental space. Um, Imi Kaur at the weekend talked about systemic um, systemic experiments and you know that that idea of propositioning bringing to life what else might be possible something that feels more speculative that we don't yet know what it's going to look like or how we're going to do it and it, it needs a space of real open inquiry and ability to sit with uncertainty and all of those things. I mean, that is just so uncommon in most funding practice. And um, yeah, I, I, and even right now, I feel we are in this real state of impasse, um, mostly if I'm being generous, because people just don't know what to do, you know, and I don't, I don't know what to do. <laughs> you know, it's not like any of us really know what to do, but some of us will feel more able to discover what to do by experimenting, not by theorizing, not by just talking to Whitehall, not by, you know, just doing what we did before because that feels safe and familiar. Some of us are more comfortable with trying new things out. Um, and that we need more funding that is willing to resource that. Um, and I guess, yeah, two other things um, that the work makes me think of, I suppose I, for me, so much of this comes down to just this, we, we have a long way to go in, certainly in the West of that recognizing our interdependence and it, that's such a fundamental flaw in how we all sit in our worldviews like that that real recognition that what we do does impact others and then you know that we we are nature like that just isn't something we we feel deep down for many of us and I don't think it's how people fund often either um so and I don't know how to create that shift, but it's quite deep and profound. And I think we're far away from that, even in even in a pandemic, which I had hoped would make that realization more obvious. And then I suppose the last thing is I I do worry, and Indy, we've talked about this too. Um that in the UK there is lots of people now talking about funding locally and place-based funding and it's all about communities and local communities and that's really important and I'm a big fan of that work but I worry that we have lost a sense of ourselves as also global citizens and that kind of the planetary level and again people want to disengage with that as a concept because it's too big and what does it really mean and how do we you know but 
that this yeah like a lot of nation states and this was from Jane Engel in a conversation with her the other day she really reminded me that nation states are kind of they're not serving us they're not going to serve the planet it, with with some of what we what we face so I also worry that in the UK we have have a, a real void of that conversation at the moment because it's so focused on leveling up in local communities yeah Thank you. I really appreciate that, Cassie, and thank you for kind of taking that overview of that. Um, and and yeah, at many many levels, I think that this is a kind of, as you rightly say, is a fundamental question. And our relationship with nature is coded into our institutions. It's coded into our, our theory of money. It's coded into our theory of contracts. It manifests that that problematic relationship manifests in everything. And and you're right that some of these things require deeper structural reforms. Peter, I'm going to come to you next, if that's okay. Largely because I think also, in a way, the work that you do, collective intelligence, collective uh, uh, collective intelligence in sort of with a machine and human systems level, opens up a question about a different theory, the body of the who. Uh, collective intelligence is a function of, of collective and they're not necessarily bounded. And it's fundamentally, I would argue, is a civic good. It's a, it's a good that sits outside individual discrete value. And it's, I would argue, is emblematic, perhaps, of actually even our theory of intelligence. Indiv there is such a thing as individual intelligence. We sit in collectives of, of these things. And I'd love to see, hear your reflections on both the technology capability sides of this new pathways that you're opening up and how they reflect back in into a new way of seeing some of this stuff. And obviously, general reflections more than one. Yeah. <clears throat> like Cassie, I'm gonna I'm gonna do a spin, and I'm gonna kind of get back to my notes of what I really want to say, and then I'll try and answer that question too. Right. I think I think the I think also to Dan's point earlier, when I read the report, I was like, how do we get here? Is it like slow incremental change, or is it the revolution to get to the the vision in the paper? And I think that is kind of a, a question of how, like what's the pace of change, and how do we get there? Um, I think the first thing for me was in in your presentation, you talked about the old pathways. And as someone who spent a lot of time diving into lots of the tools, the, sh the shoots of the emerging futures that you talk about, I almost, and I don't want to sound too negative here, but I also think we have a real kind of <clears throat> role as researchers, as critical friends, as creators of tools, as funders of them, to make sure that they don't replicate the old and how they're creating the new. And I think we all, there's a case study in the Wikipedia, which is a good example, right, of like, in one way, it's an amazing example of the commons. We also all know all the issues there are around inequality, uh, misinformation, uh, kind of Basically, it's people like me creating subjects about people like me on Wikipedia, right? And if you're kind of, if, if you're being kind of very, very, very kind of binary about the, and I think that is, uh, that is a, the first problem, which is if we want to create all of these emerging infrastructures for collective intelligence, future civics, let's make sure we do it right and not replicate inequalities of the old. And I don't think that conversation is being had nearly enough, neither within the funding community or within kind of the civ tech or the commons community. It's, it's something that we kind of shy away from because it's not the beautiful story of the future that we want to tell. I am one of the people who tell that story sometimes too, but I think it's just really, really need to recognize that. <clears throat> Which things gets me to, to, to the second point. I think, again, you mentioned region network in there as another example of how we can create these whole new systems. But again, you know, I think within that, we also need to think about kind of the technology, which is amazing and looks really smart. But what are the fundamental values that underpin that system? What do you want to achieve with them? So again, as a fan of region, worth saying, you know, here, you know, they sold, what is it, 100,000 soil credits to Microsoft, right? So Microsoft can kind of hit their 20, 30 targets for becoming um, uh, carbon negative. But does that not mean that then Microsoft just keeps flying business class and have really, uh, you know, carbon intensive service and a, a, a failing kind of net zero business model for the planet? So, you know, that sounds like, are we just kind of saying we're just recreating stuff at the edge of the system that's actually kind of still uh, not fixing the kind of the core roots, the fundamental issues that we're looking at. And I think we need to have those discussions as critical friends. Uh, I can't make a thing for, you know, so it's also hard for me to criticize, criticize, criticize the people who do create these tools, but I do feel like that is conversation we need to have so we don't oversell um, the promise of the future before we kind of fix some of the, the fundamentals. This gets me to my kind of third point. And I think that relates in general to how we think about CI. A lot of CI is actually not particularly good CI because it is it is a lot of people who are uh, very similar and it becomes quite monocultural. I guess, but on, on, on the third point, and this is where I kind of come back to where I'm from in Denmark. So when I was reading the free house example, it made me think of 
you know, a concept from Denmark in the 1930s, which is very popular around Copenhagen, called endings or cooperative uh, housing, right? Where, you know, you, you, you buy a share in a, typically a six flat in a housing association. And one, one, while you own that share, you have access to use it. You uh, join the governance of the, of the building. You can make decisions what to do about it. Then when you leave, you sell your share and someone takes over. So you don't have the kind of the mad speculation that you get in the UK. It's not as radical as the free house, but for me, it's like, it's a tried and tested example that in many ways works to kind of address some of those issues around the housing market and speculation and price. And I guess sometimes when we think about kind of the, the radical, like is the radical actually inventing new shiny things, which is looking around the world and saying, maybe there's just a completely different policy on housing <laughs> and ownership that could work to fix the same issue. And again, uh, as someone who often kind of talks about the shiny things, I also sometimes want to remind myself that there are things that work fantastically well across the world that have been working for decades that we should just replicate. If you sit in the States, you'd probably look at the NHS and say the same thing. So I think, I think it's just really, really important to kind of remember those, um, those things. And that also, in, when we talk about, there's a, there's a point in the report around um, digital democracy, which of course with my intelligence hat, this really, really goes to my heart. And, you know, Audrey, you've written many cases about the work that you do, and it's a kind of, there's a kind of gold star in terms of the field. But um, there, I think, Often we, so this year, citizen assemblies are in vogue. It's a great example. But I think for me, it's about understanding, particularly for local authorities, for cities, like what is the plethora of tools and method up that you can use to shift decision-making and engagement with communities to, 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 to kind of to empower communities and shift on that power over spending and decision-making away from local authorities. You know, and we, we know things like participatory budgeting has been in place for decades across the world. There's lots of evidence that it works, yet local authorities in the UK seem quite reluctant to do it. But across the, even across Europe, we see lots of examples that's working really well. So I guess at this point about the radical, where I'm like, I really want to get all the basics right first, and then we can kind of use that as foundation to get towards the radical. I hope that kind of, so that's kind of answering the, um, the first question. And I think that the second part around kind of the relationship between AI, I actually might part that for the questions, because I really want to make sure I leave space with the other, other speakers. Is that, is that okay, Indy? Because otherwise, uh, oh, I think we're trying to... Sorry. Totally. No, no, I really appreciate it. And I think, Peter, you bring up some important points there. I mean, the cooperatives uh, is a really good example, right? So the UK had lots of cooperative housing, and they ended up being sold after first generation in Islington. Lots of cooperative housing being sold for vast amounts of money. I know people who did that. And, and we know the cooperative housing movement has struggled also now in Denmark. And so there's a really interesting question about what does the second generation model look like? Uh, community land trusts still rely on actually land being subsidized in some folk fashion. So the, turning what is a kind of a nice idea into a, a real market societal alternative opens up some really structural questions in that format. Um, and also I think the wider point that you're making, which I think is really critical, is is it is it a, a revolution or an evolution kind of conversation as well? I think it's really important. The question I would say is that we're seeing some of the evolution happening all the time right now whether it's rivers or other things. So we're starting to see different frameworks opening up. And, and some of the deeper questions on the construction of that becomes really critical. Because I think, I, I wonder whether we'll ever fix the present and then go back to solve the deep code questions. And I wonder whether that's the trap of the present in a way. So is actually these are structural questions, but I really appreciate that. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, Caroline. I'm going to come to you finally because I think you've been an extraordinary leader in this space. And uh, well, it's true, but it, it's true. So sometimes worth acknowledging, uh, you've been an extraordinary leader in the space, and you've created vast amounts of space with great humility around this and been driving some of this conversation. So I would love to hear hear your reflections. So um, Nick, I'm going to be uh, I'm going to be uber prosaic here and uber practical, um, and um, I'm quite old, actually. I've been knocking around for quite some time. And, um, and you know, uh, I, I look at sometimes the state of the world and um, it, it gets very depressing and very hope, hopeless because, of course, as you everybody here agrees, we, we you know, we need a st fundamental structural transition within a generation. OK, this this needs to happen like within a generation. Um, and um, it needs to look at, I believe, um, fundamental norms, behaviors, and expectations. Because at the 
at the end of all of this, this is about the relationship of, of people with people and with nature and, um, and with the systems that exist. And, you know, sometimes that, that idea that things that we, that generational shift, um, it seems impossible that we can do this in a generation. But I want to tell a very, a very simple personal story. Um, my second child, Susie, she's 23 years old. And uh, when she was born, she ended up by being born um, in the hallway at my home <laughs> um, because um, I didn't have a mobile phone. Nobody had a mobile phone. We didn't have the internet. And uh, she, we, she managed to be born by ambulance and my husband completely missed the whole thing. Um, but in thinking about this, uh, it struck me that there was a point in time where the combination of the mobile phone and the internet started a global quiet revolution that has completely transformed every single aspect of our life. So at the moment, um, you know, it, it has transformed, it started off by transforming the way we communicate, but now, you know, it, it, now it, it has fundamentally changed us. So 30 years ago, the idea that you would buy food online that you haven't touched and haven't seen um, was ex like extraordinary. Like people would say that's never gonna happen. But now everything we do, our banking, our consumption, our entertainment, um, our approach to privacy and data uh, it is, totally separate and that has happened in 23 years so for me whilst like there's lots of problems with it it does show that there are ways in which fundamental fundamental transformational shifts can happen within a generation so um so i you know i that's one of the things that i through esme we keep on funding some of these ideas and yes they may not come to much sometimes Dan you're right you know they they flourish away and then they get forgotten about but there will be something I believe in all of this that you know it that will absolutely turn the tide and will create the equivalent of a very quiet movement that 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 will fundamentally change the norms, um, the behaviors and expectations. And the way I think about it is that in some ways, the mobile phone and the internet were a bit like a Trojan horse. <laughs> the expectation wasn't, there wasn't a grand plan of where it was gonna go. Um, and I sometimes, you know, and I'm a great believer in tactics in trying to get to where we need to go. And I was sort of thinking about what, what's the equivalent here of our Trojan horse? What's the thing that we can, um, that is very tangible, very human, very understandable, that impacts everybody's day-to-day -day life? Um, and for me, it would be some, something like plastic. So plastic, if you think about plastic, it touches on the, uh, you know, it's the petroleum derivative, touches on oil, touches on carbon, it touches on pollution, it touches on waste, it touches on food, it touches on farming, on, you know, how we buy things, um, on packaging. And it, like, it seems to me that it, it's not, it's not, it, it's not systemic, but it could be, it could be that Trojan horse that if we all, if, if we all focused on one or two things, um, we might end up by finding that Trojan horse that could fundamentally alter the way people think and behave. Because I think if, unless, you know, 23 years ago, no one had a mobile phone. Right now, 91% of the population of the world has one. And, and there are 7.26 billion of them. And that's in 23 years. So I'm hopeful. I have to be hopeful. 
but I'm also, I, I like to be really pragmatic and tactical about these things. So um, that's why at Esme, we do believe in testing and piloting these things that may not, that may not succeed, but they could be the seed of something that will be completely transformative. <laughs> Thank you, Caroline. No, but I think you, you, you bring it, you, you, you rightly say with a mobile phone, the scale of the transformation that's possible. What are the Trojan horses of tomorrow? And whether it's our food system or our plastic system, or whether it's these things are going to be transformed, or whether it's even even trees, <laughs> something something as simple as that, in terms of our relationship with our ecological yeah. systems, are going to be impacted. And those Trojan horses are brilliant. We are running out of time, and I really want to be respectful of everyone's time. But what I would love the speakers to do, if you can, is have a look at the questions that Gordon uh, has kindly put, uh, put up on this. And I'm going to come to each one of you uh, for brief reflections on the questions. You could pick whichever question you like that you want to chat to um, and say, look, I'd, I'd love to address this question in, in that way. Would that be OK? Mm. So if we can just uh, just to be tight with everyone, I, I really you, you're so generous in your time. Uh, I'll come uh, I'll come through that way. Um, I'm going to slightly play around with the order this time. Um, uh, Cassie, could I come to you first, please, as, as a, any of the questions you'd like and any other general reflection you want to make, but if we can just be pithy and brief. Um, okay, there, there's someone that's talking about um, people are stuck with left and right and willingness to explore something new. I mean, I, I don't have an answer to that other than my favourite word that I use every day about 10 times is, can we please appreciate plurality like there is never one way it's never the, the but you know binary thinking whether that's political parties gender whatever it might be is just a really unhelpful way of viewing the world thank you cassie dan can i come to you next please thanks cindy actually kind of picking up what caroline said i mean one of the interesting things i mean obviously her mobile phone example is terrific one and the fact you could now have a mobile phone and perhaps not, not give birth in that difficult way is terrific but in general the way the internet social media news media and everything the way it's gone hasn't created what some people hoped was you know that like communities sort of in power and all the rest of it and if anything it's got society a bit more top down i'm going to argue it's it's easier to control so i guess one of the questions is is how if if the answer to this stop to the system change to some extent it can be certain tech breakthroughs or whatever it is how do we make sure that they deliver in the kind of the spirit of, of of what you've been talking about india i think that's a big issue because tech is not neutral it's usually developed on the basis of the market and the effects are not always what we'd have wanted oh that's a brilliant segue to straight to audrey i think <laughs> So I mute myself. Right? So um, I think the the uh, meeting that I just had before this one uh, was on our annual presidential hackathon meeting. Uh, for context, this is when we crowdsource solutions to any of the 169 SDG targets and any small scale uh, experiments are uh, quadratically voted. It's a new voting system uh, into five champion teams after three months of incubation and they get a, a trophy, which is a micro projector with uh, Dr. Tsai ing president's image giving the trophy to you in a recording. So it's a self-describing, very meta trophy. Uh, what this trophy does is that it guarantees you uh, the regulatory, the personnel, and the fiscal support for your idea to be taken uh, from a small town uh, into the countrywide deployment within the next fiscal year. So we give out five such promises each year, and we got a lot of very good uh, civic infrastructures out of this because if you're a pure private sector vendor, you probably cannot mobilize sufficient quadratic votes uh, to, it has to be a real uh, social innovation uh, for, for that to, to happen. So we got a lot of very good infrastructure. And now coming back to the question, I think, um, and, and this is important because uh, the a question asks, uh, and I quote, I wonder whether the real issues are not decentralized decision-making because we know how to crowdsource them, but accountabilities and how does mutual accountable 
uh, um, ledgers or systems work. Uh, and, and I think this is really the, the crux uh, of this question, because without mutual accountability across sectors, there's no way for the career uh, civil servants uh, to, to buy the system, because all, uh, they, they care about the, the audit trail, so to speak, uh, of who exactly said that or contributed that and so on. And that's actually the, the root of the open source uh, revolution is based on decentralized version control system that can pinpoint each and every letter uh, to who contributed that and resulted in which change and so on. So I think there's a real synergy there. And, and uh, the kind of decision we made in the previous meeting about presidential hackathon is that we need to uh, separate that into two tracks, one focusing on things that could be delivered in the next fiscal year, and the second on the things that could only be delivered 10 fiscal years from now, so a longer horizon. But it will share the same speculative design routes. It will share the same quadratic voting and ideas and things like that. It will uh, go make the funding go to the, the artists, the designers, the, the poets, and so on, that creates immersive felt physical experiences based on things that people widely agree is should be made into a countrywide plan the next year, but we couldn't because it will have to wait uh, for some sort of combination of technology to happen 10 years from now. And that will then inform our research agenda for our national funded research. So basically we move uh, first in the past six years, uh, the experiment was quite successful in moving jury style decision-making from the decisional stage into the planning stage, crowdsource agenda setting. And, and now what we're doing is to move it even more further um, to the beginning, the, the radical, right? With not a AL, but with LE, <laughs> with the radical, the seeding stage uh, of the, the research community. And as uh, the most research community wants from say 6G or whatever, uh, new defining, some people say 6G uh, enables co-presence, which is the next uh, mobile internet. Uh, we want it to be steered toward the kind of uh, physical experiences that the radical civics want to inspire people, including researchers, uh, to feel instead of just extrapolating on the 5G vision. Thank you so much. Um, so much in there. Honestly, I'm going to have to listen to that recording twice. Audrey, thank you. Um, Peter, can I come to you next, please? I'd rather have five minutes more of Audrey talking than listen to myself, but um, that's okay. <laughs> um, I think there, there was a question in there around, uh, do we need new agencies or do we go with the existing ones? Um, I, I think we should try and reform our existing institutions first. I think kind of creating a new, a new separate entity would just create too much noise. Audrey is a great example of how you can do that. Um, and just for reference, for example, Nesta is currently working with the UNDP on embedding intelligence as a method within the accelerator labs. And so it's there that you, you can do it. it, it's hard, but you can embed some of these methods and approaches in, in how existing institutions do work. Thank you so much. Uh, Nick, could I come to you next? Yes, thanks, Cindy. I'll be quick. So I guess to, to try and ambitiously address two questions. What, how might we create the fundamental mind shift away from funding outcomes and specific deliverables to funding experimental spaces and ideas? Uh, and then the, the other question, uh, I wonder if the real issues are not decentralized decision making, but accountabilities and who takes them. To link those two, I would say that the, the answer to the first one is kind of the second one, which is around grant funding. I guess I would say that probably uh, most of the time the wrong people are making the decisions. They're a very, very long way away from the communities or the experiments or even the ways of working of that are being proposed and, and are really just in the job, job of kind of risk mitigation a lot of the time. Um, and the accountabilities built into grant funding are really messed up and weird. You get have an accountability to this kind of distant grant funder rather than accountability to those you're working with and alongside in pursuit of change or the people you're working for and on behalf of in pursuit of change. So you, you don't have really any accountabilities to those who share your ambitions or you're working with. So um, like via that kind of grant funding relationship and those outcomes and outputs. So, um, so yeah, I think, yeah, I think that the grant funding is actually, and again, whoever unproposed a kind of two day workshop, um, I would agree and say, and one of them could be on grant funding because it is not beholden to kind of state-based deliverables or market-based expectations. And yet it gravitates towards both of those models a bit too readily, but it, it is this precious resource, uh, which could be pouring more kind of readily into the civic space and the experiments that we're describing and these ways of working. Thank you, Nick. Caroline. <laughs> um, yeah, I, mean, uh, I just wanted to come back with Dan because 
the example I gave wasn't because I believe technology is a solution or it, it's to show how fundamental norms and behaviors and expectations globally can be changed within a generation. Um, and I would always argue that this kind of change is can never be made without it really resonating with people's everyday lives. Um, it has to be something that they value, everybody values. So uh, a Mrs. Smith in Taunton would be listening to this conversation and saying, I, I have no idea what you're talking about. You know, this does not, this does not resonate with me in my personal life. So that that's why I was coming, trying to come up with something very tangible, which has captured 91% of the global population within a generation and has fundamentally changed commerce, public services, everything. Um, and uh, I do think we there is something here about beginning to adapt this into something that the everyday person can relate to in their everyday lives. I think that's absolutely brilliant, Carol, because I totally agree. Unless we can make these kind of abstract theories practical in everyday experiences, and I think it's the everyday which is problematic. And I think unless we realize the our everyday lives are right at a problem size, it becomes it's a real challenge. So thank you. I really firstly want to thank the speakers. You've been incredibly generous and you've been incredibly contributive. And I know, Audrey, thank you for your time zone. You've stayed up and to contribute. It's always a pleasure. And I think you are leading practice which will infect the world. And I want to recognize that. And I think it's a very powerful piece of uh, reflection. And like to everyone here, I mean, Nick. Thank you genuinely for your leadership and, and being a really good friend in this process as well. And Peter, as always, even with the work we did with Civic AI and everything else, I think that this side of conversations of new values that are emerging, really, really powerful. Dan, thank you. I really appreciate you coming to a space like this as well and actually contributing because I think it's important that we bridge and we hear different perspectives and we work across them. And I genuinely mean that. And thank you for, for coming here. It's really critical. Um, and Cassie, again, similarly, I say that you, you've been a really big supporter and for taking the risks to make some of these things happen. I just want to acknowledge them as part of that process. So um, the final point I would like to just add is that I would like to say a big thank you to Fang, who actually led this project and actually led the research and did a lot of the work. So I think it's really important to acknowledge that and also some of the members of uh, members of DM and Shift, which were part of supporting this. So I really want to thank you all. And my sincere apologies for running over time to all of you as well. So that's the final thing I do want to say. Thank you. And thank you for everyone that's listening. And so many great questions. Uh, join the Discord community. There is a community. And there is uh, there, the downloads, uh, download. All, you can download all the documentation as you need. And we will hope to carry this conversation forward genuinely. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very thank much. Hi. Live long and prosper. Bye. Cheers. Bye, thanks.